I was exposed to pornography for the first time at the age of three. I didn't really understand what I was seeing, but those images affected me for years to come. After that, I was sexually abused by multiple people throughout my life, both men and women beginning at the age of five, and then raped repeatedly as a teen. I just felt such a deep sense of shame about myself. Rather than seeing myself as a victim and being mad at the perpetrators, I thought that there was something wrong with me. And I carried that with me and I didn't talk about it. I remember writing suicides at the age of eight years old. I was in so much pain. It also taught me that my value is in my sexuality because that's what I received attention for. On top of all of that, I lived in a very chaotic home in a chaotic neighborhood. There was a lot of gang rivalry and I remember one day watching someone stabbed to death in front of my eyes and I couldn't have been older than nine. And I didn't even tell my mom because it wasn't that strange of a thing for me to see. My mom was a cocaine addict and my father was an alcoholic who left before I was a year old. Because of her addiction and his absence, I was just left really unprotected and exposed to a lot of things that I shouldn't have been. And I was also left with a very deep sense of longing for a father and for a male figure to show me love and protection and affection. One of my abusers was my mother's boyfriend and I was 13 years old at that time and being a teenager I started getting a little bit feistier and standing up for myself and I told her either he goes or I go and I ran away from home so she realized I was serious and she agreed that she would ask him to leave. He left but she left with him leaving me at the age of 13 and my eight-year-old brother alone for three months to fend for ourselves with nothing but $20 and a book of food stamps. I used it for tortillas and butter because that was the cheapest thing that I could buy to feed my brother and I. And after the money was gone, I started stealing food from the liquor store down the street. And I remember just asking my brother to stand outside on the corner because I didn't want him to get in trouble if I got caught. And it was at that point in my life that there was an older boy in the neighborhood and he came around and he made me feel protected. And he would tell me, you know, anybody in the neighborhood messes with you, tell them I got your back. And he made me feel provided for. When he was around, I didn't have to steal food. He would take me to the liquor store and he would buy my brother and I food. I just, in him, started getting the male attention that I had always craved and longed for. And even when the relationship became abusive physically and emotionally, I stayed because in a very sick and twisted, dysfunctional way, he was meeting some need of mine. And truth be told, I thought that's what love looked like anyways. I watched my mother and my stepfather have a very violent relationship and you know, remember waking up in the morning and, and cleaning up the glass from their fight the night before. And so I thought that that's what relationships look like, that they had a, an element of abuse just embedded in them. And so that was normal to me. And now looking back, I realized that he had in his mind from the very beginning to to sell me, to pimp me. And he came from a pimp culture. And I remember one day when I was about 15 years old, we were sitting on a bus stop on Lincoln Boulevard, which is a track in Venice. And he said, I could sell you if I wanted to. And the next person that walked by, he looked at them and he said, anybody got a nickel? Like he was gonna sell me for a nickel. And eventually that's what ended up happening. By the time I was 19 years old, I was um, working in a strip club and coming home and giving him my money every night and just trapped in this lifestyle and trapped in a relationship with him. And so that's the point that I was at in my life when I met someone who showed me the unconditional love of God and she had a faith that was real and genuine and it just, I mean, it oozed out of her pores. She just was such a light and when I told her the circumstances of my life, she never judged me. She just loved me and she just showed care for me as a person. And eventually I took her up on her offer to go to church because I saw that something in her life, that she had something that I was missing. I didn't want to go to church with her at first. It was the last place I wanted to be. I was afraid of church. I thought if there is a God and I don't know if there is, then surely he wouldn't want anything to do with someone like me. But finally, I just took her up on her offer. I figured I had nothing to lose. And I remember walking in to the Oasis in LA and just feeling like I was home and I would do whatever it took. I, I didn't know much, but I knew I had to keep coming back and I, I did. You know, there was a time where I would go to church on a Wednesday night and then go to the strip club afterwards. I remember actually the night that it hit me, I was standing in the middle of the strip club and it hit me. I was created with a purpose 
And I looked around and I said, this can't be it. There has to be more. And it was out of that place of just an internal revelation that I began to make different choices in my life and eventually left the sex industry and left the boyfriend. And it wasn't because someone was pointing fingers at me and telling me how to live my life, but it was because I began to understand truly that I am loved, that I am valued, and that I am purposed, and that God has a good plan for my life. And so I ended up going to serve for a few weeks at an orphanage with Iris Ministries in Mozambique, Africa. And, you know, like a lot of people, I went out there thinking that, you know, I was gonna do something or give something, and I just found that um, I learned so much more from them and from that trip than, than I could have ever thought about imparting to them. Nobody knew my story. I had never shared my story publicly by that point other than with the people that I was in recovery with and my therapist. One of the nationals, asked if I would share my testimony on a trip to the bush. And I said yes. I prepared to go and share my story and I remember stopping and asking the translator um, if he had a word in his language for stripper and he didn't know what I was talking about. And so I, when I explained it to him, I remember him saying, oh, prostitute. I had to just really wrestle in my heart and come to the understanding that I had prostituted myself, that I sold my body and I sold my sexuality for money, and that is prostitution. That was just a really huge revelation for me and really great because now I work with women from all areas of the industry, whether it be trafficking, you know, dominatrix, prostitution, porn, and, um, and at the end of the day, many of us have the same stories of brokenness and experience the same kind of pain, and there's really no difference. So I find myself in the middle of the bush under a tree and I thought it was a church because we had just been to another tree that they told me was a church. So I thought this tree was also a church and so they asked me to share my story. I remember being really shocked because when I gave the altar call, I was surprised that everybody responded and I thought, if this is a church, why isn't anybody here Christian? And then later found out it was actually a bar and they were making homemade alcohol and they were all pretty much drunk. And I was like, how perfectly fitting that the first place I ever share my story is in a bush in Africa at a bar under a tree. That became a huge, defining time in my life because it was that trip that inspired me to start thinking outside of myself and start thinking with a, a mission-hearted kind of mindset and also realizing, you know, here these people were on the other end of the globe. We had nothing culturally really in common. We had, um, you know, geographically nothing in common, but they connected with my story and they connected with my pain and realizing that God could use that and realizing that my Christian walk didn't have to look like me putting my past in my past and pretending it didn't happen, but that God had a purpose for me that included the pain from my past. And as a matter of fact, the pain from my past and the things that He had brought me through and the things that with His strength I overcame are the very things that fuel the purpose that He has for my life. After a, several years of my own recovery, I just began to realize that it couldn't just be about me anymore. That God had taken me far enough in my recovery that I had the capacity to start thinking about other people and that perhaps I could do something to help other people. I found myself one day sitting across from the strip club that I used to work at and I remember feeling like I was sitting outside of a prison that had held me captive and just thinking there has to be something I can do and calling out to God and praying that He would show me. And, uh, I found a stack of postcards in the console of my car and there was a picture of a woman on them and she had pearls draped across her back and the caption read, her value is far above rubies and pearls. And I remember thinking that is exactly the message that I wanna share with the women in the club that I used to work at. And I didn't really know what I was doing but I went up and put those postcards on the cars of the women who worked there. And it was really from that moment that the entire vision of treasures was birthed. And so today, Treasures is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we reach women in 170 strip clubs a year and porn conventions with that message that they are loved, valued, and purposed. Now we've grown to the point where we have a drop-in center and a therapist-led support group and a mentoring team, and we basically just come alongside the women, just like my friend came alongside me, and show them healthy community and give them the tools and resources that they need to live the flourishing lives that God has called them to. And we partner uh, with Triple X Church and we train leaders from other churches and we have, you know, right now, um, over 30 throughout the U.S. and Canada 
that are reaching women in the sex industry in their communities and caring for them and becoming a healthy community for them to grow and heal in. And I just want to encourage you that God wants to use all of you your story, the good, the bad, the ugly, the things that maybe you're feeling ashamed of, the things that you're afraid, you know, what if other people knew about that abortion? What if other people knew that I had been abused? What if they knew about the household I grew up in? And maybe you think that those are the things that would keep you from living fully in the purpose that God has for you. I just wanna tell you that that is a lie from the pit of hell and that God can use and redeem even those things that you're so afraid to bring to him and you're so afraid to tell him or you're so afraid that the people around you would find out about that those are the exactly the kind of things that he's going to use as a part of the plan that he has for your life if you surrender them to him my name is harmony dust this was the truth and i dare you to live it